Hi everyone, and thanks a lot uh, for coming to our talk. So I'm uh, Daniel, uh, and with me here is Ari, and this is a project that has been uh, done by a few people. So there's Sam and Louis who are in the audience, but uh, won't be presenting uh, here today. And so today we're going to talk about uh, security risk in DeFi, and in particular we're going to try to sort of give some definitions and explain how technical security and economic security are, are different or how they differ. Uh, so a quick outline of um, what we'll be presenting today. So this talk is uh, meant to be fairly accessible, so we'll start by presenting a bit the different primitives uh, used in DeFi, um, and then we'll present a couple of protocols that, are, um, that can be built. Or, and once we've done this, we'll enter a bit more into uh, the main part of the talk, which will be explaining what uh, technical security and economic security is. And we will finally uh, present a few open challenges for research uh, with a focus of, on these different types of security. Uh, so I will start uh, on a very high level, but what is DeFi? So uh, we have a couple definitions and properties for DeFi. So the definition we give is a peer-to-peer -peer powered financial system. And for it to be called DeFi, we're saying that it should have a few idealized properties. Uh, first one being uh, non-custodial, which means that participants should have control on, over their funds at any point in time. Um, and next one is that it, it should be permissionless. Anyone should be able to participate in these financial activities without restrictions or without being able to be censored by a third party. Um, it should be openly auditable, which means that anyone can look at the state of the blockchain or what is powering the DeFi and um, be able to see the transactions and what is going on. And finally, it should be composable, which means that different protocols should be able to communicate with each other and um, to interact uh, to form sort of new financial uh, systems on top of this. Um, so, well, with um, this DeFi coming, there has been a lot of um, controversy and all. And we can see this a bit as like two sort of um, very pop point of views, an optimistic and a pessimistic point of view. Uh, for the DeFi optimist, um, DeFi is a huge technological advance. Uh, it's a new financial system that's openly auditable and that has all the properties um, listed before, and that's obviously very promising for the future. And there has been already a lot of good things with DeFi. For example, um, stable coins like DAI um, has been used uh, in countries like Argentina to fight inflation and this sort of things. Um, and also we have seen that more custodial system has tend to fail in some places where um, Decentralized finance could, could have allowed people to have more visibility on what was going on. Um, on the other hand, there's also this pessimistic view um, that is that, well, DeFi is unregulated, it's hack prone, um, there's, it, it can allow people through its pseudonymous nature to, to commit many sorts of crime like scamming, money laundering, uh, and so on. And uh, well, there has also been like many hacks, as probably you have all seen, um, and this. North Korean hackers hacking protocols, and also um, recent, a bit more recently, uh, the crypto mixer uh, be, being sanctioned, um, and and so on. Uh, so well, in this talk, well, we'll we'll focus mostly so on security, which is uh, something that we think is absolutely uh, it's a complete must for um, the DeFi, the vision of the DeFi optimist to be fulfilled. And really what we'll be trying to do is to, to differentiate between what is a technical security problem and what is an economical security problem. Uh, before this, we'll give um, a bit of background around like different primitives uh, that are needed for all this. And um, we'll start uh, with some very basic assumptions here is, well, all ZFI protocols rely on an underlying blockchain and it assumes some security properties which are consistency, integrity, and availability and there cannot be any DeFi without these to begin with. Um, then it uses a few other properties of the blockchain, and here one that I want to highlight because it's very, there's a lot of sort of security issues because of this are like um, many potential, let's say. It's atomicity, which means that if a transaction starts, it will either succeed, succeed completely or it will revert, uh, but there cannot be a, a half uh, transaction. That's kind of, that just cannot be. And, um, and obviously, DeFi relies on smart contracts, which are um, 
programs that run on the, on the blockchain. Um, and using these primitives, uh, there are a few really um, essential pieces of software um, and of other primitives that are uh, required for DeFi. Uh, first one being oracles. So because blockchain cannot have access to off-chain information, somebody needs to take this off-chain information and put it on-chain. And, um, th and these are called oracles and are used, for example, to, to get price of, say, USD, because this is not an information you could possibly have. Then there is governance, which is used typically to upgrade DeFi protocols with time, change parameters, and this sort of things. Um, then we have keepers, which are off-chain sort of bots and that will submit transactions to update states. This is because um, in most blockchain systems, you need a transaction to be able to perform any sort of state transition, and therefore somebody has to take care of this. And finally, there are many market mechanisms that are uh, used in DeFi. Uh, there are collateralization, where people will put, put some money at stake um, to make sure that he, he cannot default on the position, for example. Um, then there's arbitrageurs. Um, there are also liquidations, uh, liquidations which are used if somebody does not have enough uh, collateral for whatever position. Uh, so that covers roughly um, the main primitives that we'll need um, in DeFi protocols. And now I'll present just a couple of DeFi protocols. Probably some, most of you are already familiar with these, but just to highlight a few properties um, so that we can kind of all be on the same page uh, to start talking a bit more about uh, security aspects. Um, so there are many types of protocols, but we don't really have time to go through all of them. So we'll first uh, start with uh, automated micro makers, uh, which are uh, decentralized on-chain decentralized exchanges, because on-chain it's way too expensive to have some uh, order book based um, uh, DEXs, uh, AMMs, or somehow has become uh, extremely popular, and they have a lot of good properties, a few properties that are less good. Uh, but the main idea is that people will come um, and provide liquidity uh, to a pool that consists of typically two or more assets. And by providing this liquidity, they in some way commit to a portfolio uh, of these underlying assets and a portfolio that will be rebalanced um, by arbitrageurs that will try to keep the prices consistent with some um, other off-chain, for example, prices or prices on some other exchanges. Once that is done, people can trade through this pool and that generates fee for, fees for the pool. And typically, this is profitable in the case where they are volatility harvesting. I mean, that's why the talk just before was a lot more advanced than this. But basically, it's, if the price is around some line and going up and down, it's typically profitable, as opposed to if the price is consistently diverging, then maybe not so. Um, and it, there are still some risk, and especially uh, strategy risk and adverse selection risk uh, involved with uh, these AMMs. Um, and another um, very important uh, type of protocol for DeFi are uh, protocol for low level funds, also called lending protocols, which are on chain markets where people can uh, borrow and uh, lend um, assets. So typically, people will come and deposit some assets that are pulled in smart contracts. Other people can come and borrow these assets. Uh, and to do so, they will need to be over collateralized so they cannot default on their position. Um, and an interesting thing is that. Um, there are um, algorithmic interest rates, um, and which means that typically with these markets there is no duration risk. Um, and if a borrower um, would default on his, on his position, which means his collateral ratio is not high enough anymore, uh, he can get liquidated um, based on uh, rules that are imposed by the protocol. And a final point that's um, also very sort of uh, typical to DeFi. Um, our flash loans, that's quite an interesting primitive because it allows people to um, um, borrow money without having any under collateral, uh, any collateral and um, the, the condition for this is that they repay uh, this loan in a single transaction. And this works mostly because of the primitive I described before, which is atomicity. Um, so with all this, then these protocols can communicate together, as I mentioned earlier. And for example, one person could deposit some money in an AMM and get some LP shares and use these MP shares, for example, in lending protocol as collateral to be able to borrow some other type of asset. And that's a, a very interesting thing with DeFi that all the protocol can really very easily communicate. Um, so now that um, I'm done with this sort of um, intro background about uh, DeFi itself, we'll dive a bit more into uh, the security. And we'll really try now to, to um, delineate technical and economical security. Um, and first, we'll start with some informal definition. And um, 
So we say here that for um, protocol or smart contract to be technically secure, it needs to be secure from an attacker who is limited to atomic actions. And where like here being secure is mean it cannot get exploited. We have a more formal uh, definition of exploit in the paper that uh, we'll show at the end. But uh, for, for example, it could be not to be able to steal assets. And so here, atomic actions means that the action would be either a single transaction or either a bundle of transactions. But the property needs to be that all these actions will be executed atomically. Um, and because of this, so technical, um, so attacks on technical security are risk-free because basically the attacker can just perform the attack, and at the end of the transaction or of this atomic operation, he can see if yes or no he made money, and if he did not make any money, if he made money, he profits. If he didn't, he'll only pay the gas fees and can reverse the transactions. So by definition, um, or by kind of extending the definition. A technical attack will always be risk-free. Otherwise, it it will fit our other type of attack. And some there are some examples of um, technical attacks are uh, atomic MEV, sandwich attacks, and for example, like reentrancy, or also attacks that exploit uh, logical bugs. And that's all now fairly well studied. We know more or less how to protect against these. There are, of course, like testing smart contracts very well, and program analysis or formal methods. And these are, in general, uh, the better studied ones. So Prep of smart contract vulnerabilities, we have reentrancy, integer manipulation, uh, logical bugs, all of which are by now quite well studied. There are you know, single transaction sandwich attacks, which is where um, if a protocol, say, would use the spot price of an AMM uh, to, to use as a price in their protocol, an attacker could come and imbalance this AMM so that when the protocol would try to look up the price, it would get the wrong price and an attacker could fairly easily exploit this to make money. Um, our governance attack, if it's possible in one transaction to do some perf governance action, that like could come, probably borrow enough, con enough governance token to do so, and execute some malicious proposal. Uh, lastly, there are uh, transaction ordering attacks, so for example, displaymans attacks, where an attacker could um, front run some particular transaction to make profit instead of uh, the person who initially initiated this transaction. And also multi-transaction sandwich attacks, which are uh, an attack in where an attacker could come um, and see that somebody is trying to swap, but have, for example, a very high slippage um, tolerance, and he could imbalance the pool before to give the, the victim a bad price, and then rebalance the pool after, and would get the profit that the victim lo uh, lost because of the, of the price he got. So now I'll give it to Ari so that he can talk about economic security. So the other type of security, uh, we define uh, a protocol is economically secure if it's not profitable for an attacker who can perform non-atomic non actions uh, to manipulate the protocol into unintended states uh, that, where they can essentially like, extract uh, assets from the protocol or cause other sort of mayhem in the protocol. And so economic security is about where you have an exploiting agent who's trying to manipulate some sort of incentive structure uh, of the protocol to profit, like by stealing assets. And uh, since these are non-atomic, uh, they have upfront tangible costs and are not risk-free. Basically, you have to like set up, a, set, it, set up the attack uh, and then actually perform the attack later on. Um, and something could happen in between that, uh, those, two, uh, those two times. And basically, something, the attack could fail if something happens in, in between those, uh, those two actions, and such as the market responding or other agents responding. And to address this, we really need to have economic models of what's happening in between these transactions. Uh, and the attacker would need to, to understand this and basically manipulate what's happening uh, in between these transactions. So let's hammer down a little bit uh, further what the difference is between technical and economic security. So in a technical exploit, uh, we have an attacker who's effectively finding a sequence of contract calls that leads to a profit. And these are either in a single transaction or a bundle of transactions, um, but it's being done uh, all at once or not at all. And for these, uh, formal models of contracts are basically uh, enough, so to say, although it can still be quite a hard computer science problem to work out sort of optimal, uh, the optimal ways for attacks to be performed. In comparison, an economic, in an economic exploit, 
uh, an attacker is performing multiple actions kind of at different times or really po different points in the sequence. And they don't necessarily control what happens between those actions. And so there's no guarantee that the final action is profitable. So there's kind of a setup. There's uh, actually performing the attack later. But in between, some sort of market can respond or other agents can respond. And so the attacker doesn't really know if, uh, if it's profitable uh, at the end. And for this, we need models of what's going on in between, um, which is a bit different than just formally verifying contracts. Uh, and so this is kind of an open area of research, uh, especially around kind of understanding liquidity of markets. So let's hammer down even a little bit further with like a very simple example of something that'll be a technical exploit and then something we can change a little bit about it that turns it into instead an economic exploit. So in the example of a technical exploit, let's say a protocol uses an instantaneous AMM price as an oracle, and that then an attacker performs an atomic sandwich attack uh, to steal assets from that protocol. Because this can be done atomically, this is a technical exploit, but we could change it. Uh, we could use a, a smarter choice of Oracle so that this isn't possible, and that leads to instead it being an economic exploit. So here, consider that uh, the protocol instead uses a, a little bit smarter choice of, uh, of Oracle, a time-weighted average AMM price, but these can still be manipulated over time, but it involves uh, risk for the attacker, but they still may be able to steal assets. And actually, something like that just happened uh, very recently in, in Mango, I believe. So we can see this also like in, in data about what's been happening in different protocols. So one example here to kind of illustrate this a little further is something that happened in Compound in November 2020. Now, this wasn't really clearly an exploit, but it kind of illustrates uh, what could have been an exploit and what can be exploits in other protocols. So basically, the price of DAI was trading on, uh, on Coinbase, and for a very short period of time, uh, the price pumped to $1.30. And because Compound was using uh, Coinbase as an oracle, um, this allowed a lot of liquidations to be possible on Compound. Uh, and that cost a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of LPs uh, money in Compound, and opened up a lot of opportunity for uh, profit from liquidating those positions. Now, this wasn't clearly an exploit, but you could imagine that uh, somebody might set this up intentionally, manipulate this market uh, that manipulates the Oracle price, and then profiting from the, uh, from the resulting liquidations. And that's essentially uh, what we've seen later as well. So in a clear exploit, uh, something similar happened in Venus in, uh, in May 2021, um, where the, the Venus market uh, uh, was was uh, manipulated, and essentially the attacker was able to leave the protocol with a lot of bad debt. And again, just recently, something similar happened also in Mango. So how do we, what are the tools available to like, help to fix economic security and, and make protocols more secure? One of the first ones, uh, the biggest, is really over-collateralization. Uh, and here, um, it, this doesn't come without risks, though, and so it's very important to uh, include uh, an analysis of the, the actual economics uh, in designing and calibrating your, your protocol. So, for instance, you could have persistent negative shocks that affect uh, collateral prices, uh, and you could also have kind of illiquid markets around those, uh, uh, th those assets, and this can lead to loans being uh, under-collateralized and the system being left with bad debt. Uh, it can also lead to situations where it's unprofitable for liquidators to actually initiate the liquidations, uh, which then also can lead to uh, the protocol having bad debt because the liquidations don't happen in time. And there's also sort of issues uh, that can happen with stable coins and deleveraging um, of these stable coins, like we saw on, uh, on, in DAI on Black Thursday, where you had this like short squeeze effect and you also had this sort of like uh, collapse of the, of the liquidation engine. Some other things that you need to be aware of when you're designing protocols with respect to economic security is the minor extractable value that you can be, can be setting up. Uh, I won't go too in-depth here because there have been a lot of great talks already about uh, minor extractable value. I'll just point out that DeFi applications uh, tend to give many new sources of MEV, and you need to be considering these. And this is essentially coming from arbitrage opportunities. So for instance, in, uh, in DEXs, you can have sort of like stale order quotes, and whoever fulfills those uh, is able to do an arbitrage loop and profit. And in lending protocols, uh, there's usually a, uh, 
uh, a liquidation incentive, and if you're the person who can come in and perform the liquidation when it's, uh, when it's allowed, then you can profit from, from being the person who does that. And this can lead to consensus layer risks um, if this MEV is greater than the block reward. Another important area is in the design of governance and the risks that can come up from your governance layer. Um, so the governance is basically introducing a way to upgrade protocols. And these need sort of careful guardrails and careful design so that your governors aren't going to have misincentives to do things that are actually bad for protocol users. And so commonly, governance may not really be incentive compatible with the actual users of the protocol. And this, uh, this can be an issue. They may not act in the interest of these protocol users. And to, to illustrate a little bit, in some sense, governors have some honest uh, cash flows. Uh, but uh, these cash flows may not always be very high. Sometimes they can crash. And then, uh, if they do crash, the region of incentive compatibility might shrink, and it may be more profitable for these governors to, instead of doing uh, sort of honest actions and upgrading the protocol in good ways, uh, to instead decide to attack the protocol and basically steal assets from the protocol or do other things that put uh, protocol assets at risk. And the cost to do this can sometimes be very low in DeFi and should be part of uh, the design of governance systems. So for instance, tokens can be borrowed um, and agents can be pseudo-anonymous and this can lead to uh, low costs to, uh, to actually do these governance attacks. The last one I want to hammer down a little bit on is this: what we were talking about in the examples of where you have markets or oracle uh, manipulations uh, that can directly affect uh, your protocol. So here we need to distinguish between uh, one, a market price that is being manipulated, but correctly supplied by an oracle, and two, uh, an oracle that is itself being manipulated. So in market manipulation, you have an adversary who is manipulating the market price, either on or off-chain, depending where that market is, is occurring, uh, over some period of time, and they can profit if, uh, if they can... Uh, if, if the manipulation it, it, they can exploit it in, in a protocol that uses uh, that market as an oracle. And these problems persist even if the oracle is not an instantaneous AMM because it's just, uh, there is some liquidity in the market. Depending on that liquidity, uh, there's some cost to affect the market price and you can instigate uh, changes to market price that are then reported through the oracle system. And importantly though, this is risky. Uh, because you have to do it over time, it can't be atomic, which is, again, the main point about uh, economic security. And this compares to oracle manipulation, where uh, it, it depends on the design of your oracle, uh, but even if the market price is not being affected, uh, the oracle might be reporting incorrect prices. So centralized oracles have uh, potentially a single point of failure, and you might want to control for that in designing your protocol. And on-chain AMM-based oracles um, as we've seen, can be manipulated. And so the costs of manipulating that, depending on the liquidity in those markets, is something you should be carefully considering. And other decentralized Oracle solutions are really imperfect uh, for the issue that you can't really verify the correctness of prices on chain. And so it's quite an open problem how to do this very well. So that uh, sort of concludes our discussion of uh, technical and economic security, but it leads to a, a host of new uh, research challenges uh, that are really going to be important for securing DeFi protocols into the future. So I'll give you just like a quick, uh, a quick flavor of these. One is around uh, composability risks. Uh, mostly these are not very, very well quantified, um, but a lot of program analysis can be done to, to uh, to understand these risks a bit better, and then to design your protocols in ways where, uh, where how you're composing with other protocols is as safe as possible. Another is what we were just talking about, this governance sort of risk, and modeling uh, the incentive compatibility of, of governors, and sort of modeling out what we call governance extractable value, and trying to understand when uh, are governors in your system incentivized to do things that are good for the protocol, and how do you stop them from doing bad things? And these need economic models about how these governance systems work over time and how the agents make decisions. Another is around oracles, uh, so um, basically a similar sort of role as governance, incentive compatibility to report uh, correct prices. 
and then um, in a fair amount of work to be done in, in MEV. And there's just uh, one illustration of sort of like what makes MEV very hard is that um, if, you're, if you're looking at just intra-block MEV, atomic MEV, um, this, this becomes an optimization problem that resembles uh, knapsack, but where the items in the knapsack uh, can change depending on the current selection. So it should be even harder than knapsack. And so it should be an NP-hard problem. And this becomes even harder than if you're looking at interblock uh, MEV, and this includes cross-chain MEV, uh, because now you have to look at uh, an intertemporal version of that, uh, of that same uh, optimization problem. And there's also a lot of work to be done in sort of making uh, anonymous DeFi protocols and preserving privacy. So that brings us to the end of the talk. Uh, just as a quick recap, we've covered how DeFi has uh, several innovations, but it also has several risks. And to fulfill the, ver the, the vision of the DeFi optimist, we really need to make sure that DeFi is secure. And to do that, we've delineated uh, two types of security risk between technical and economic security. And the key distinctions that, uh, that allow this uh, to be useful are that it's based on atomicity, and it really tells you a lot about the models you need to understand security in your, def in your uh, DeFi protocol, and the types of models that we, as researchers, uh, need to build out. So thank you, and let's uh, open it up for questions if we have time. Just while we're waiting for the mic. Um, so this is based on the papers that uh, we wrote, and this is a QR code in the link if you want to have a look. And there are more formal definitions in there, so please feel free to take a look. Um, <clears throat> so how does this overlap with a lot of what Gyroscope is doing and sort of your mission and, and vision? Um, I'm super, super curious about that, yeah. That's a great question. So how we've designed, uh, so as a Gyroscope, we're working on a, a new stablecoin project we're building a bunch of different uh, primitives that allow what we think is a more resilient uh, stablecoin design. And it's really coming out of all of the research we've been doing. Uh, we've set up some of the initial models that like, help to understand, for instance, economic security. And the mechanism design that went into Gyroscope takes all of that knowledge into consideration and tries to do uh, the best mechanism design that we can considering uh, how we understand economic security today. Thank you so much. Remember, the venue will be open this weekend, so come and talk with the people, with everyone, close deals, etc.